Rounding out our session for today, we have Dr. Adam Sutton, an Associate Principal Scientist at Merck Research Labs, working in vaccine analytical research and development. Dr. Sutton moved from Australia to the US in 2021 to work in vaccine development. Prior to working at Merck, he completed his PhD in analytical chemistry at the University of South Australia in 2020 and a Master's of Chemistry at Western Sydney University in 2015. Dr. Sutton's NMR experience was in the characterization of branched homo and copolymers with QNMR and diffusion NMR. At Merck, he works with several instrumentation for vaccine development, including benchtop NMR for QNMR applications. His talk today is entitled Quantitative Benchtop NMR for Vaccine Development. And Adam, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, that looks all right. Yep, all is good on our end. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you for this opportunity to talk about um, what we do with our Benchtop NMR. So uh, uh, as Kelly mentioned, I work at Merck uh, and just to give people an idea, um, when you work in the pharmaceutical industry, you kind of have different spaces that you can work in. Uh, so my colleagues and I, we kind of fit within this blue box where there's a discovery phase where something will be found to have potential medicinal benefit. And then um, our group begins to take over uh, in that stage when they think they've found a potential candidate. And then we will help to uh, develop that vaccine product uh, through the clinical trials. And then if all the clinical trials go well, and this looks like a great um, vaccine, then we'll have it uh, put into our commercial area. And so we will, uh, work on developing our analytical methods uh, for throughout the taking it from discovery throughout the clinical trials and then handing them over into the commercial space. Uh, and so our headquarters for Merck is based in New Jersey, uh, but most of our vaccine research takes place at the West Point site in Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, and so that's where I'm calling from today. And so at Merck, we have a big history in vaccines and we have all different kinds of vaccines. Um, so just recently, we had the Capvaxid um, vaccine, which is based on polysaccharides, which is an immunococcal uh, vaccine against you know, diseases such as uh, pneumonia. Uh, and we've been working on that platform for many years now. We also have a recombinant uh, protein-based vaccines, such as the things for like hepatitis B and for the human papillomavirus. And then we also have a mixture of live attenuated vaccines. Uh, you know, people uh, usually take the measles, mumps, rubella uh, vaccine from Merck. And then some of these are also uh, like the rotavirus vaccine are orally taken vaccines, not just injected. And then we also have the Ebola virus vaccine as well. And you can see that here, this is just the commercial vaccines that we have. The vaccines that are coming through of the pipeline from Discovery they can come in all different shapes and sizes. So we can have them, um, you know, they can be polysaccharide based, live virus back, uh, live virus based. They can be recombinant protein based. And um, we can also have RNA based vaccines uh, and other different forms of proteins as well. So when you work in vaccines, you never quite know what kind of uh, um, chemistry you're gonna have to work with each day. And so when you uh, work with vaccines, there's kind of like three major areas that you can kind of break down the components into. Um, firstly, there's the active components. Uh, so these are the things that will be providing the immune response. And those things can be like the polysaccharides, they can be proteins, proteins that assemble into uh, virus-like particles, which are kind of like protein nanoparticles. Um, and then you can also have viruses as well. Uh, and then those viruses can come in all different um, shapes and sizes, like you can see here in the images. But then we also need to use excipients. So these are things to ensure the stability of the vaccine and ensure its self, uh, shelf life. So we can just have things like buffer components, which maintain the pH, uh, as well as other stabilizing agents, which will uh, prevent oxidation and maintain the longevity, prevent things sticking into the glass syringes. And then there's also the component here, which is the adjuvants. Um, so most vaccines will uh, the, that you know, typically uh, other than live virus vaccines, you kind of need to put something in there to enhance the immune response. Uh, and so these adjuvants, their role 
is to enhance the immune response and provide that longer immunity against whatever target disease. And so these can also be a wide range of chemistries. So we can have alum, which is like an aluminum salt. We can have different lipid-based emulsions. Uh, and there's also oligonucleotides is another common adjuvant. Uh, and so when you have uh, a vaccine that's going through development stages, uh, you can have any combination of these active components with different excipients and different adjuvants in place. And so the vaccine pipeline is a very complex and diverse a set of chemistries, uh, and it requires a lot of different analytical tools in order to do that. So for us, um, one of the analytical tools that we're growing in favor of is benchtop NMR. Uh, and so we typically think of benchtop NMR as a competitor to uh, liquid chromatography and gas chromatography for the quantification of small molecules. Um, so we like to think of using our benchtop NMR for quantifying like the simple excipient components like the solvents and the buffers uh, and the other stabilizing agents. But then we've also found other examples uh, of reaction intermediates uh, in the vaccine area, which uh, involves small molecules. And we can use benchtop NMR to quickly analyze those small molecules. Our other ideas that we have for benchtop NMR is for raw material identification, uh, and as well as providing a lot of outline and online monitoring uh, so that we can have fast uh, you know, responses to understanding a process. So you can monitor things in real time and then be able to address those like process challenges uh, you know, directly and quickly instead of having to take a sample, uh, submit to a chromatography method that exists in a different part of the site, which undergoes lots of sample preparation. Uh, and so, you know, I guess all the other talks here were about very high complex uh, nuclear magnetic resonance measurements. Uh, for us benchtop things, it's all about being as simple as possible. And so when you compare a high field system to a benchtop system, you know one of the big differences is the price. So a benchtop system is something that just plugs directly into the wall. You don't have to have any of that liquid helium, liquid nitrogen or compressed air to maintain your system. So it's a very green system. It's a much cheaper system uh, and then you know, if you also like compare to chromatography, then you don't need to use all the solvents either. And then, you know, for a lot of the experiments that people will do with high field spectrometers, you typically have to use deuterated solvents for like locking the system or avoiding doing solvent suppression. Uh, but for the benchtop systems, the, you don't need to lock onto the sample and we can, applying solvent suppression is usually ideal for our quantification. So that makes it a lot more streamlined for us. And it means that we have a lot less sample preparation. Uh, and then each day, you know, you're in, you basically prepare the benchtop system with like one shim, and usually that will hold uh, the magnet's homogeneity throughout the day. And then the simplicity of the software is another big advantage that we like. Uh, of course, you know, while this convenience and price advantages uh, is really great for benchtop NMR, it does come at a cost. So the resolution that you're gonna get compared to a high field system is usually like about a 10th of the resolution you're gonna get. And then the sensitivity is uh, like for NMR in general is quite difficult. So for benchtop systems, the sensitivity is very poor. So we typically only work on measuring things that are above one millimolar in concentration. And so with that kind of in mind though, so uh, we, you know, we usually consider doing high field NMR for when we have to do these structure elucidation problems or when you have really complex challenges like the other presenters today. Um, but for when you need like just quick quantitative measurements, that's where we see benchtop NMR having a role. Uh, and so it's not really a machine that's specific to NMR spectroscopists, but just a general tool for everyday scientists to use in their lab. Uh, and so to kind of talk more about why we, you know, like the benchtop NMR for these like quick measurements, so if, if uh, you have, you know, different kind of vaccines coming in with different active ingredients, different adjuvants, uh, it can be difficult to know what analytical tool you'll need just to measure something simple like the buffer component histidine. And so uh, the example here that I show you is uh, an NMR spectrum of a vaccine intermediate, which contains various polysaccharides, salts, and proteins. And in a benchtop NMR, due to the like lack of sensitivity and because normally these larger species are very, give very broad signals. You don't see any of them. They're all lost in the baseline. 
And so the only components that we see are those stabilizing agents, which are typically st smaller molecules like the histidine or this polysorbate molecule. Uh, and so here we have very good selectivity uh, that enables us to quantitate the histidine or polysorbate directly. Uh, we don't have to worry about removing any of those salts or uh, other active components, which can often interfere with other analytical methods. And so for us, when we have to like choose an analytical method, it's very difficult to screen several different methods uh, just to you know, measure something simple like histidine. So what we like about the benchtop NMR is that you can just take your sample, put it into, put it directly into the benchtop NMR, obtain a spectrum, and you'll quickly be able to tell, will you be able to resolve uh, the compound of interest? Uh, and if you don't, you can just take the sample back out again because it's non-destructive, um, which is very difficult to say for like chromatography methods where you could potentially contaminate your system or, you know, you're going to be um, cause you have to like dilute the sample or potentially, uh, you know, you'll have interference from these other molecules. And so that's, you know, uh, why we like it because you can really work in a trial and error basis, which is kind of the easiest way for us to work in the vaccine area because it's very hard to platform when you have so many different kinds of chemistries that come your way. And so if we were gonna quantitate the polysorbates and histidine here, we would just take our sample directly into the tube. And then we could quantitate with an external reference uh, of polysorbate or histidine. Uh, in situations where we just, me just measure histidine, um, what we'll do is we'll take the sample and then we'll mix it with our uh, DSS D6 uh, internal standard, um, which just comes like directly as a solution. And so it's not much sample preparation involved when you're just mixing two solutions together. And then you can uh, quantitate the histidine directly from that internal standard. And so the ease of just taking a vaccine sample that's very complex, putting it directly into the system and getting a quantity uh, makes this a very desirable technique. And so we've done our comparison of using benchtop NMR for quantitating these uh, components like histidine and polysorbate to the traditional chromatography methods. And so you need to do two different kinds of chromatography if you wanted to measure both of those species within the NMR, you can just use the one method. Uh, and you know our differences for PS20 are usually less than 5% uh, and then usually less than 10% for histidine based on the traditionally used chromatography methods. And all these values were obtained by an intern that we had, uh, kind of demonstrating like how easy it is to perform these benchtop NMR measurements. Uh, and part of that comes in with the software. So for us, what we want to be able to do is you take the sample, put it in the tube, um, and only have like very minimal sample preparation, like either no sample preparation at all or mixing with the internal standard. And then you can build a processing method directly in uh, the SpinSolve software that I show you here. Uh, and you know then have it automatically tell you the concentration of the components. Uh, and so that's really easy when we have this um, situation where many people just want to quickly check that their buffer concentration is correct. So they can simply put it in the instrument and it will generate the number for them. They don't have to do a lot of data processing. And so we've tested this out, like how difficult this is many times now. We've had four different uh, interns come in. And then usually what happens is we'll give them about a one hour lesson on using the SpinSolve software. Then for a week, they will usually be playing around, asking us questions, how to use it. And then after a week, they can program a method perfectly themselves. So I can just say, oh, can you make a method to quantitate citrate? based on our DSS internal standard. Uh, and then usually they can you know, make that in a couple hours in the software. Uh, and you know, anyone can then come put their sample uh, in a tube, put it in an instrument and get that measurement. Uh, so for us, you know, that the simplicity of the, sol uh, the software is a really great advantage. Um, some other examples of applications for benchtop NMR we have. Um, this is a quantification of ethanol in a liposomal formulation. Uh, so the liposome is used uh, as an adjuvanting product, uh, adjuvant in this case. And then to make it, we need to uh, dissolve all the lipid components in ethanol. And then this ethanol is then evaporated and then reconstituted to, to self-assemble into a liposome. And so we need to ensure that the ethanol is um, cleared in majority. And so this was a simple uh, method that we would do with our 60 megahertz uh, benchtop NMR system, uh, where we would just take the liposomal formulation directly, mix it with that DSS internal standard of known concentration. Uh, and then we could instantly like build that processing method to quantitate uh, from the DSS the amount of ethanol. 
and you can see here again like the liposome is so broad it has like the the t2 relaxation that uh, causes a very broad signal there and it's relatively low in concentration so you just get a small hump um and so that doesn't interfere with that quantification of ethanol here and while gc is typically ran for these things and you'll get 10 uh, maybe 100 times better sensitivity that's not uh, essential uh, for what we're doing um the limits of quantification and detection that we can get with the bench stop and mr are uh, within what we need Another example is for lipid nanoparticles, which are used for mRNA-based vaccines. Uh, in this case, they're a bit more tricky because uh, you will still see some uh, broad underlying signals related to the lipid nanoparticle. Uh, but with benchtop NMR, it's very easy to apply a T2 filter, which will uh, selectively remove the large signals from large species like the LNP. And then you can still see ethanol there. Uh, and in this case, in their process, they need to do uh, several like uh, buffer exchange steps. And so here they, with each buffer exchange step, we're able to track the loss of ethanol um, just by mixing the internal standard in with the formulation directly. Uh, and then the green line here indicates what our like target like need is. And so before they used to do 10 of these buffer exchange steps, but with us being able to monitor these things very quickly in an at line manner, um, they're able to reduce the number of uh, buffer exchange steps they do so that they can you know, reduce the overall time in making this uh, lipid nanoparticle, which uh, speeds up the process of making the vaccine and prevents waste of you know, unneeded steps. Uh, another example we have here is uh, this is a model uh, decatalyzation reaction, which is like a deprotecting kind of group. Uh, and so typically this is done on a vaccine molecule, which is very large. And then there's a step where we need to uh, do a decatalyzation and this results in the formation of pyruvic acid. And so we can measure online. So this is having um, the sample, the reaction like pump directly through the bench stop and we can track it in an online fashion and quantitate this pyruvate. Um, talking to our process colleagues, they didn't really wanna have to set up uh, an online monitoring process, but they were happy with an at line process where they would just take an aliquot directly from their reaction vessel and then mix with our DSS internal standard and be able to quantitate that pyruvate. And so they wanted to have uh, a reaction that would um, provide 80% decatalyzation uh, within a three-day step because you need very mild conditions because you don't want to disrupt the active components of the vaccine too much. And so this is what a benchtop NMR spectrum of that looks like. And you can clearly uh, see the pyruvate amongst that complex mixture in the vaccine. And so they could uh, apply this method here, you know, just directly taking that internal standard of known concentration uh, in there. And then they would know how long it was going when before they would just go for three days, submit to a measurement, hope that they had reached what they wanted. Uh, now they can actually be sure and know when to stop the reaction uh, in a very easy outline manner. So our conclusions is that um, for us, the benchtop NMR is a very convenient tool uh, because you know we can try it very easily on whatever we're trying to measure. If it doesn't work, that's fine. We can move on and try something else, but it's very easy to try uh, is an early stage thing. And since it doesn't require like a NMR spectroscopist with a lot of years of experience, uh, we can use this for many people in our area because most people are not NMR spectroscopists. Uh, you need people of diverse uh, analytical backgrounds to work in the vaccine area. And for our experience, you know, you can be just as accurate and precise as chromatography methods, but you can be faster and you can be a lot greener. And so that's a big advantage for using the benchtop NMR. Um, and of course, it's very versatile, but only when you're looking at your high concent concentration components, because the small things will be lost. Uh, and so the difficulties that we do face is, you know, like trying to measure components when they are very low in concentrations, because we have low sensitivity, as well as having like signal overlap problems, which especially make it very difficult when we're trying to have automatic data processing. Uh, it can be difficult to like handle like um, these signals here, which, you know, I've um, noted with a blue circle there. You know, it, to quantitate them accurately, you really can't just uh, integrate and assume that the baseline is at zero. They're always on an angle, they're on the tail of other peaks. Uh, and so we want to do what chromatography people would do, but we would have local baselines. And so this is another example here where we put the DSS in and then we could quantitate these species. Uh, but yeah, the having, in this case, we have to do a lot more manual data processing because of that peak overlap. Uh, and then sometimes we can have difficulty in solvent suppression, so measuring signals around the solvent can be challenging, uh, but not impossible to do either. And so this is, you know, some people I'd like to acknowledge from 
the Merck analytical and process teams who've really been driving the Benchtop NMR technology. Uh, we also have a lot of help from Magritech, which is the instruments that we use. We currently have a 60 and 90 megahertz Benchtop system. And uh, we also have had a sweep of interns. So for us, we know that, you know, if all these interns can handle this Benchtop NMR technology easily, uh, any other scientist can as well. Uh, and so there, I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful talk. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, I think it's uh, really great to see how people that may not be spectroscopists are able to utilize this. So hopefully it can get more people into the NMR area. We do have a handful of questions in the chat. I think we'll only have time to take one of them live. Um, so perhaps after the fact, you could go ahead and answer them in the chat. But the first one is, which part of your work has to be done under GMP? Any comments from your side on Benchtop, NMR, and GNP? Sure. So we do know that other companies um, will do, like, use Benchtop, NMR, in GMP spaces. We're just beginning to do that now. Um, and so it is completely possible. But for a lot of our work, we don't have to be in a GMP environment. So in these situations that I'm giving, we're just enabling people who are making the vaccine, like a specific point of the vaccine, like a way to uh, respond to how they're making it and better optimize how they're doing that process. And so in that process optimization step, you don't really need to do things under GMP conditions. Uh, if we were making this in a manufacturing space where you needed to know exactly when to stop the reaction, then it would be in a GMP space and we're working towards having those kind of things implemented. Uh, but at the moment, that's um, not necessary. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, um, and so I think the other questions, if you would be able to answer them in the Q&A chat, that would be greatly appreciated. Sure. Thank you again, Adam, for a wonderful talk. So that brings us to the close of today's webinar. Um, thank me, um, join me in thanking our speakers once again for a wonderful series of scientific talks and how they're utilizing stable isotopes and NMR in the vast research areas that they work in. So thank you once again to all of our speakers and to you, our attendees, for participating throughout the webinar. To recap some of the goals we aim to achieve today, um, I think that for sure we can say that we saw the breadth and scope of stable isotope applications in the field. And I think we can all agree that we had many new insights shared from our panel of speakers. I hope that you were able to understand your understanding of CIL's products and how they can be used in the field of NMR. We hope that you see how we as CIL can support you as a research partner and supplier in all your different research areas. Thank you once again to all of our speakers um, and to you all our attendees for staying engaged throughout the webinar, as well as for your participation in the Q&A sessions. Um, right after the Zoom link closes, we are going to be having a general survey um, for you to provide feedback so we know what you liked, what we could do better for the future, or what you want to see again. Um, we'll also send out a follow-up email with uh, links to today's talks and other relevant information and please feel free to reach out to us by email or visiting our website for any questions, product requests, or orders that you would like. Um, we also have the QR code for our webinar registration for the environmental session. So that will be next Thursday if you would like to join that. Um, and this is the current lineup of speakers. So thank you once again um, for all being here, participating, and joining us throughout the Isotope Day. And if you'd like to stick around, I think Adam's still answering a few of the Q&A sessions, so maybe we can hold off on closing the session um, for right now. But thank you to all of our speakers and for participating in this year's NMR Isotope Day. Yeah. Thanks, Katty. Thank you. Have a good day, guys. Bye.
Okay, I think I answered everything. <laughs> yes, I think you did. Thank you so much, Adam. It was wonderful. So we really appreciate you guys being able to speak. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good one. Okay, thanks very much. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>